much. And uh, I've been traveling around speaking so much, and it's really nice to be able to um, have a five-minute drive to give a talk, too. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Berlin um, and to live here. So I'm going to be talking about the psychology of eating animals for effective vegan advocacy today. And I'd like to start out by sharing a quote with you from a renowned psychiatrist, traumatologist Judith Herman, who says, the ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness. <clears throat> atrocities, however, refuse to be buried. Equally as powerful as the de desire to deny atrocities is the will to proclaim them aloud. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. And think about your own experience with what Judith Herman is talking about here. Do you feel, how many of you notice that people turn away when you try to talk to them about the atrocity that is animal agriculture? And how many of you here feel that compulsion to speak out and break through the denial? So you can relate to this, right? And when you do, when you do speak out, how many of you relate to this response? <laughs> that you get? You can just shout it out. No. Nah. <laughs> I love bacon. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, we're advocating, when we're talking about veganism, we're advocating moral consistency. Um, you know, we're advocating health. We're advocating things that you would assume most people would be on board with. But more often than not, the response we get looks something like this. <laughs> So, the question for us that I'm going to talk about today is why? Why is it that people resist veganism? And how can we actually move beyond this resistance to advocate more effectively? Now, I want to start out by talking about um, my own work, which some of you in this room are familiar with, and I won't spend too much time on it. But there are many reasons that people are resistant to veganism, okay? I mean, bacon tastes good. Um, and, you know, it's easy to eat animals, and eating animals has been promoted for a very long time. I, as a psychologist, and as a social psychologist in particular, I'm going to talk about the psychological and sociological underpinnings of this resistance or this defensiveness, which, in my opinion, is really, in many ways, the foundation of the problem. Now, the problem is self-reinforcing, right? The more the public, the more meat-eating and eating animals is promoted in the public, the more, you know, we reinforce the psychology that eating animals is the right thing to do. But on the deepest level, we have a psychological framework. People have been born into a psychological framework that teaches them that eating animals is the right thing to do. And I say them, but I actually should say us, because we're all born into this dominant ideology that I've actually uh, come to name carnism. Carnism is the invisible ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. Now, carnism is essentially the opposite of veganism, and it's a sub-ideology of speciesism. People often ask me, like, you know, Melanie, why are you talking about carnism when, you know, as you all know here, after all the conversations we've been having this weekend, obviously, the bigger issue is, in fact, speciesism. Carnism, as I said, is a sub-ideology of speciesism, just as anti-Semitism, for example, is a sub-ideology of racism. Focusing on carnism, in my opinion, is very, very important. I and mean, when we think about the way the world actually is today, speciesism is a concept that is so abstract, so difficult to wrap our minds around. I mean, as soon as you start talking about speciesism, you get caught up in the ethics of whether to, like, you know, swat the mosquito off your arm. And, and it's a very difficult conversation, and people don't have an existing schema for the opposite of speciesism. So if I don't want to support speciesism, what do I do? Well, kill myself, right? Or what, is it possible to not be speciesist on the planet as it is today? So I think it's important to talk about speciesism, but focusing on carnism gives us something tangible, concrete, and um, much easier to advocate. And in my opinion, um, it's, it's just a much more practical, we're doing outreach to the general public, a much more practical frame for talking about or thinking about the issue. 
Now, Carnism is a dominant ideology. It's invisible, it's entrenched, it's woven through the very structure of society, so it's essentially institutionalized. It's maintained and promoted by all major social institutions. And it is therefore internalized, right? Shaping the very way we think and feel, or actually don't think and feel, when it comes to eating animals, right? So we, when we're born into a dominant system such as carnism, we learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And this is where you know, my interest, uh, or my research, um, has really been focused. It's not on carnism as a philosophical construct. It's on carnism as a psychological construct. What is my question when I you know, first became vegan, vegetarian, when I was your age, um, many of you, a long, long time ago now, um, and then vegan, you know, and I suddenly like, was looking at the world through completely new lenses, at least it felt that way to me, my question was like, how did I go through life being totally blind to what was right in front of me? I was a person who cared about animals and compassion and justice and was active in, in human rights initiatives, and yet I was participating every single day in a global atrocity that has caused more bloodshed than all wars, famines, and natural disasters combined, without having any idea what I was doing. And I was curious, how could people like myself, how is it possible that this atrocity and other atrocities are enabled by people who actually do, in fact, care? Now, carnism is a violent ideology. Um, and I don't have to explain to you guys why it's violent. It is organized around intensive, ex extensive, and unnecessary violence toward other animals. And it runs counter to core human values, like all violent ideologies, values such as compassion and justice and honesty. And so in order to maintain itself, carnism needs to use a set of psychological defense mechanisms that essentially distort our thoughts and numb our feelings. They disconnect us from our natural empathy so that we act against our values without fully realizing what we are doing. Carnism is structured to teach us how not to think and feel. It prevents rational thinking, and it blocks natural empathy. And it does it in this way. Okay, you can see this, right? Is the white clear enough? So, okay, so I have to apologize for this terrible graphic, but I have a Mac, and it will not let me make a circle. And I don't know why. So pretend this is actually a feedback loop, because that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> And thinking about effective altruism, I finally said, is this the best use of my time? And it wasn't to try to make a circle on a map. I was once after a rationalization for having a last slide. Okay, so the ideology creates these defenses, okay, these defense mechanisms that are myths that I'm going to talk about, which distort people's perceptions, which block people's feelings. Our narratives often create our feelings, not always, but often, which enable behaviors which then loop back to reinforcing the ideology. So to spell it out more concretely, carnism uses the defense of objectification, causing us to think of animals, in particular farmed animals, as things or as objects. We think of a turkey as something rather than someone. We don't feel the natural emotional response that we otherwise would. We eat turkeys. The more we eat turkeys, the more we believe the idea that turkeys are meant to be eaten. Make sense? Sort of. Somewhat. Take a picture of them. Um, so, I will explain this a bit further. So, it, this is a self-perpetuating. Carnism has become self-perpetuating over the years. Now, I'm going to explain some of the defense mechanisms. I don't have that long here, and I know a number of people are familiar with my work on carnistic defenses in the first place, but I'll just explain a few of the defense mechanisms so you get a sense of, of what I'm talking about. Um, before I do that, I want to point out that carnism uses um, what I call a two-pronged strategy, right? Like other oppressive systems, in order to maintain itself, in order to stay alive, carnism needs to do two things. It needs to strengthen carnism and weaken veganism. And it does this by using what I have identified as two different types of defense mechanisms. 
I call them primary defenses. The primary defenses basically validate carnism. That was an exam like the example I just gave you, right? So <clears throat> they validate the idea that eating animals is the right thing to do. It's legitimate. Secondary defenses exist to invalidate veganism, right? They, they invalidate veganism by inva invalidating vegans, invalidating vegan ideology, and invalid, in, you know what I'm saying, invalidating the vegan movement as a whole. So um, I have written um, on both of these much more extensively than I can communicate in a short time today, but I'm going to give you some examples of these. And the most important thing to remember is this two-pronged structure of carnism, okay? Maintaining the dominant system by validating the myths that maintain the system, and of course, squashing or weakening the system that, shoot, that, that, um, that challenges it. Now, at Beyond Carnism, um, we actually take a two-pronged strategic approach based on this model. Uh, all of our programs are designed to either weaken carnism or strengthen veganism, and ideally to do both of those simultaneously whenever we can. So here's one example of primary carnism, um, what I refer to the three as the three ends of justification. This is a mythology that is you know, deeply institutionalized. Eating animals is, you know this, or you can guess, normal, natural, necessary, right? Nice. There was some researchers actually, there were some researchers recently who just who published an article in Appetite um, based on my research on the three ends, and they found a fourth end, and they called it nice. Um, tastes good. So, um, so we could we could definitely include that here. And again, carnism is structured like other violent ideologies or violent systems. Um, so of course, all of these or many of these defenses that I talk about in relation to carnism do in fact apply to other violent systems. And this is, I think, a very important um, component of carnism awareness. So for example, slavery was called normal, natural, necessary, and probably nice too by some people, um, male dominance heterosexual supremacy. We can go on and on with this. One more example of carnism of primary defense is um, seeing animals as abstractions, in particular farmed animals as abstractions. We recognize the individuality of our dogs and cats, for example, we give them names. But when it comes to pigs, in our minds, we learn to think of as pigs, you know, that a, a pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. There are a number of secondary defenses. I'll just name a few of them, okay? So secondary defenses, as I said, one of their purposes is to invalidate vegans. Um, you know, if you shoot the messenger, you don't have to take seriously the implications of his or her message. So this is a very um, effective strategy. Um, one form of projection is, or one defense is projection, projecting onto vegans. So for example, vegans are called biased and extremist when they challenge the biases and extreme practices of the dominant culture. Or when we advocate peace, we're stereotyped as to who loving tree-hugging hippies. Or, and there's nothing wrong with being a hippie. But there is a problem with being reduced to a one-dimensional stereotype. Okay? When, we, when we express our legitimate and appropriate outrage at the atrocity that is carnism, then we are stereotyped as militant human haters. Or we're supposed to be super vegans who never... Okay, so this is a projection of what I refer to as the impossible ideal. We're told or believed, vegans are believed to, like, that we have to live up to an impossible ideal in order to be able to justify our ideology. Otherwise, everything we stand for becomes discredited or invalidated. So, super vegans who never what? <laughs> who don't have a car. Who get sick? How many of you have actually, like, hidden the fact that you're sick? Because you didn't want somebody to blame it. I'm like, oh my god, you sneezed. That diet. <laughs> right? And then the guy next door who just had quadruple bypass surgery has bad genetics. <laughs> Super vegans who never get angry. So, um, and who eat nothing but kale. I'm going to talk 
very briefly about what I refer to as neocarnism. It's another secondary defense. Um, in my opinion, what I've observed is as denial, which is actually the main defense of the system, denial that there's even a problem in the first place, right? It, everything stays, in, the whole problem stays invisible, including the fact that carnism exists. You know, it's like there are vegans and vegetarians, and then there's everything else. So now that denial has been to some degree weakened, thanks to the efforts of vegan advocates and of uh, you know, the, the internet and the dissemination of the decentralization of, of information, the three ends of justification have taken on uh, a new role. They've taken on more importance. Um, and so there's this, this attitude, this kind of anti-veganism, and let me back up and say that there's a lot of pro-veganism happening. And you know the world in many places is becoming increasingly pro-vegan. However, there are also forms of carnism that I call neo-carnism that are starting to emerge as a, a reaction to challenges to the dominant culture. And these are the neo what I refer to as neo-carnism. Um, it's this idea that not eating animals is what it's abnormal and unnatural and unnecessary. It's basically the opposite of the of primary defenses, right? So we can see one example of this, and I've written about this um, a lot more extensively than I can talk about today, but these justifications have taken on, they've become ideologies in themselves. So for example, not eating animals is abnormal. I call that um, compassionate carnism, where it's this idea of well, I don't know. Do you guys say happy meat in Europe? Yeah, like bio fleisch, happy meat, humane meat. You get what I'm talking about. Organic meat, right? That's an example of a neo-carnism, right? So it's it's the public actually saying we want to do less harm. We're concerned about this. Our awareness has been raised, and of course, animal agribusiness coming in and giving them a quick fix for this, a solution that's not really a solution, but the idea is, well, you know, being vegan is really abnormal. It's radical, it's so far outside the norm. So instead of actually become vegan, I'll just eat animals that are happy to be eaten. So it makes sense. So that, that's what I call compassionate carnism. It's a new form of carnism, and there's actually a lot of writing around this. An example would be like, you know, people, well, Michael Pollan is actually, do you know Michael Pollan here? Um, so he's, anyway, there are a lot of writers who are talking about this idea of like, the problem is not eating animals, the problem is factory farms. And that act is in fact a form of carnism. It's a carnistic mentality because when we challenge the carnism, when we challenge it, the irrationality becomes apparent. For example, most people would consider it cruel um, to slaughter a happy, healthy, six-month-old golden retriever just because people like the way her thighs taste. And yet, when the exact same thing is done to individuals of other species, we are taught to think of that as compassionate or humane. So these are carnistic distortions, new carnistic distortions. And as I mentioned, these are a part of a reaction of the culture. They're a part of a, a vegan, in my opinion, a backlash against veganism. Backlash is when the dominant culture reacts to, to challenges to its power. And you know, social change is like a chess game. It's like a chess game. You know, you move your piece and you challenge your opponent, and they're not just gonna lay down and be like, okay, take the queen. Um, you know, they're gonna push back. And it's very important for vegan advocates to recognize this because Again, our narrative creates our feelings, our feelings drive our behaviors much of the time, and if we believe that happy meat means we're failing, we're going to feel despair. If we recognize that happy meat is actually the result of our successes, we're going to feel very differently and maintain our motivation. Now, carnism awareness matters, and I'm going to talk about like specific t techniques for like individual advocacy, like when vegans are advocating um, to, to the public and to people in their lives. But I do believe that that one thing that we need to do is to build carnism awareness into some of our outreach, and carnism awareness matters very much. Um, it matters because when we understand carnism, we understand that eating animals is a social justice issue. It is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It's the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched, oppressive system. 
this, by the way, um, I'll talk about this a little bit later. This is a picture of me. Are the animal equality of Spain people here in the room? Well, them. Fine. Uh, well, they were. <laughs> this is them. They organized um, a talk when my book came out in Spain. Animal Equality Spain um, partnered with the publisher, and this was a press conference we had. And and actually, right before the press conference, one of my colleagues said, um, you know, I just want to warn you, like Spain is like not quite where like Germany and the U.S. is right now in terms of like veganism or support for veganism. People here still feel like if you stop eating red meat you know, you might die or at least get sick. Um, and so this is a picture of a press conference we had, and I, we were talking about my book and, um, and, and, you know, and carnism. So I was talking about how eating animals is really a matter of social justice. Carnism awareness highlights the system as the main problem, not simply the individual. It's, it's, it's very difficult for people to get on board with social change if they're only all they know about is the solution, but they don't recognize the problem in the first place. And when we recognize that it's really the system that's the biggest problem, then we can recognize that good people participate in harmful practices, and this doesn't make them bad people. And so it creates, carnism awareness creates vegan allies. Just as feminists have been successful in their outreach by saying, you know, they're not saying everybody has to be a feminist to be a part of the solution. I mean, most people, unfortunately, don't consider themselves feminists today, and yet the vast majority of many populations in the world are against sexism and support anti-sexist initiatives. So I think for us, we need to really think about that. Right now, as vegans, we often say, like, either you're vegan and you're part of the solution, or you're eating animals and you're part of the problem. But we can also recognize that people who support the ideology of veganism can be active participants in the transformation of carnism without being fully vegan themselves. So after this press conference was over, there was a silence that settled over the room for a minute. And the whole time I was stealing myself for like, oh my god, what are they gonna, how are they gonna react? What are they gonna say? The first question that was asked from the first journalist was, what can we do to help? And the next day, and in the days to come, all over the Spanish press, international Spanish press, Spanish press, went beyond Spain itself, was eating animals is the inevitable result of a system of oppression. And they had a section about becoming an active witness of what you could do to transform the system. And this was pretty amazing, and I think a fabulous example, one of many, but a fabulous example of vegan allies and how people can respond when they get on board with carnism awareness. What year was that? What year was that? Um, two years ago? Three years ago, maybe, maybe now. Um, La Tabla Suisse. Um, I, can you, I don't know if you guys can see this that well, but I'm going to play you a very short video. Um, there was a video that we made. Um, it, it was a collaborative project between uh, Vivu, Vegetarian von Deutschland, Sebastian Joy's organization, and my organization, Beyond Carnism. And we made a two minute video that some of you have seen before. Who has not seen this? Oh, okay. Well, there's a lot of people. So I'm going to actually share this video with you, and then I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk talk about it very briefly. So we made this two minute video. It was an advertisement. Uh, the public did not know we made the video. I should just point that out. It was actually put online and ended up going viral. It was picked up by press in 25 countries and four continents. It was all over, in, in many countries it was all over the press, but it, it wasn't in the US, but it did go viral. And it really opened up a, a public dialogue to a much larger degree than we had anticipated about the ethics of eating animals. We did not use this video to get people to go vegan. This was actually part one of a two-stage multi-stage multi process. Let me just share this with you. For me, true success is doing what you love. And I'm really thankful for the life I have right now because I can actually live from my passion. I just do what I love most, you know, and that's cooking. Cooking is like art to me. I'm inspired a lot by nature. Nature is where I feel free and good. My name is Maurice Bono, I am from Switzerland and I'm a chef.
Switzerland is my home. That's where I grew up, where I have my roots. As a kid, I always watched my grandmother cooking. She was always a huge influence for me. I want to reinvent my grandmother's recipe in another way. The Brazilian which is the most tender part of a cat. So we came up with this idea of opening a seasonal restaurant called La Table Suisse. For La Table Suisse, we created a five-course menu. The two highlights are the most likely, and especially for the main course, the Pussy Luc. In Switzerland, it's legal to eat cats and dogs as long as they're yours. And because of our adoption system, we are the first restaurant in Europe to be able to serve this traditional meat. I often wonder why so many people are against eating cats and dogs. I respect vegetarians that don't eat any animals. But if people eat chickens and pigs, it just doesn't make sense not to eat other animals. I'm very proud to say that all of my guests appreciate my work. And for me, this is really rewarding. I never really thought about to become successful. I just wanted to do what I love most. And that's cooking. So I share that. So you can imagine this was it was actually pretty fun monitoring the media response. Somebody actually set up a website to try to debunk, you know, is Latapa Suisa hoax? We think the cat was really a rabbit. I mean, he was silicone, so I mean, they made a cat. But anyway. Um, the reason I share this, and the really interesting thing about this, is that this video was made in collaboration with, with us um, and um, one of Europe's leading PR firms and one of Europe's leading production companies and directors. And that's why it was so, that's why they didn't know we were like a little animal rights organization, because it was so well done and so professionally done. We were able to afford to do this because all of those people donated their time to us and none of them, to my knowledge, was vegan, or even vegetarian. And this is a pretty amazing thing. Now, we have, we were able to, in one week we reached 10 million people with this, because of non-vegans, because of vegan allies. And um, I think it's very, very important for us to recognize um, that there are, there is a lot of good that can be done by people who may not be vegan themselves, but who are willing to be active in the transformation of carnism. And this was actually how we started our conversation with them. And um, at the end of the talk, if I have time, we're actually, we're making a new version of this that I'll, I'll share with you a little bit more about. Um, you know, so carnism awareness also has a benefit because it, it weakens carnistic defenses. Um, when we name defenses, they lose a lot of their power. I believe that it is impossible to have a truly ob objective conversation about the issue of eating animals as long as we are operating from within the very system that conditions us to believe that that is the right thing to do. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. I gave my talk at, um, oh, no, anyway. This TED talk that I had given, a TEDx talk, um, I got a standing ovation from 800 meat eaters, um, you know, and, and there's something to be said. This was talking about veganism, but it was also illuminating cardistic defenses and enabling people to be a part of the solution. Carnism awareness also enables us, it exposes carnistic bias. So we can recognize, for example, that when somebody studies nutrition, they're actually studying carnistic nutrition. And it's very important for us to start exposing and naming these biases. And it can support vegans, it can empower vegans by reducing recidivism. Um, it is secondary defenses can take a tremendous toll on us as vegans. Many vegans internalize these defenses, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that happens later, um, and can feel isolated, disconnected, um, you know, believe in some of the negative messages they hear about themselves. And you know, when we understand carnism, it can enhance our advocacy significantly because we actually understand our audience. More, a lot better. And finally, understanding carnism, it actually exposes, as I said before, the psychological underpinnings of oppressive systems in general. One of my goals for my work on carnism and like really identifying the structure of carnism was trying to identify the structure of violence in general. And I mean, I'm not making a claim that this is all that violence is. 
However, violent ideologies are structured in very similar ways, and we can apply some of this understanding of carnism to how we approach raising awareness about other social issues and how we work towards social transformation in a variety of ways. Because the content, it matters very much, right? The animals matter very much, but animals are a part of a much bigger whole, and on a deeper level, the issue is not the animals, the issue is the mentality, the consciousness that enables people to allow this kind of violence toward anyone, human, non-human, or nature, to be exploited. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the how. Okay, what are some specific strategies we can do to bypass or transcend some of this defensiveness? Now, I want to just talk about, when I talk about effective advocacy, let me just define what I mean by that. Um, effective advocacy is communicating in a way that increases the chances the other will allow themselves to be influenced. It's not changing hearts and minds, it's rather opening hearts and minds. I don't know if you've ever tried to change somebody, you ever been in a relationship? Yeah. It doesn't. Work. Sorry, Sebastian. Um, it doesn't work. So how do we how do we increase the likelihood that our message will be heard? One thing that I think is really important is to not expect the facts to sell the ideology. I mean, if you happen to be a rational person. Identify, I should say, identify as a rational person, and I think there are a lot of people in this room who identify as rational people. Most people actually do, but um, who really, you know, do commit to thinking rationally. You might think, well, of course, the facts sell the ideology because they sold it to me. I read Peter Singer's book and I went vegan. What's the problem? That's not the way most people operate. And I think it's really important for us to relate to the world the way it is, not the way we wish it were. And for most people, they are not going to simply change their minds because they get the truth. Because, you know, they can hear the truth about animal agriculture and they're at the McDonald's drive through the next day. So, um, you know, we really need to, to, to relate to people the way that they are. You know, and to recognize that people change, they make the kind of change from carnism to veganism when they're ready and not before. Colleen Patrick Boudreau, another author and a, a good friend of mine, says that you know the goal of vegan advocacy should really be to plant seeds. To plant seeds. And because that's the best that we can do in many ways. I mean, of course, there's legislation and other things, but I'm talking about one-to-one -one advocacy. We need to know when not to advocate, and there are certain situations when it's really, you know, important that we don't advocate to psychopaths, uh, okay? A psychopath, by definition, is a person who is genetically incapable of experiencing empathy, and psychopathy exists actually on a continuum, and uh, in the U.S., I think it's 1% of the population that's clinically psychopathic, and about 10% that falls on the psych psychopathy continuum, and then in upper-level corporate management, numbers are actually a lot higher, go figure. Um, but that's another talk. Um, but, you know, there are over seven pe there are over seven billion people in the world today, unfortunately, and what that means for us is that we can actually pick our battles, so to speak. Don't reach out to the people who are the least likely to hear the message. If somebody really doesn't believe that animals suffer or really doesn't get a shit, then move on to one of the other 600 and 999,000 billion, whatever, people. See, I'm really good with math. Um, when emotions are high, if you're triggered, if you're emotionally charged, probably not a good time to advocate. People pick up on the emotional tone. Um, you know, to those who are deeply invested in carnism, I know, and people who are like, you know, I know many vegans who spend a whole lot of time trying to convince the hunter next door not to shoot rabbits once a year, that's not where the numbers are, and that's probably not the person who's going to be most open to the message. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we're as effective as possible, and we're more effective when we reach more people. And when we reach out to the low-hanging fruits, we're a lot more likely to succeed. And when your own sustainability will be compromised, like, certain times, like, you don't want to be that token vegan, right? You just want to, like, go to a party, have a glass of wine or beer or whatever, or not, and have fun and relax. And you don't have to be, like, leaving that party going, oh, shoot, I should have, could have, would have said that. Now that person's going to eat animals because I didn't advocate properly. Oh, my God, I'm an animal killer. That, 
doesn't serve us. That contributes to burnout, and burnout's a big problem in the movement. When it's not going to be sustainable for you, when it's going to feel exhausting, when you really don't want to do it, just don't do it. Have another potato chip and enjoy yourself. Um, I cannot stress this enough. Um, this is a whole talk. No, it's multiple talks. Okay, I give like three hours on this on um, workshops and could do a lot more on effective communication. Suffice it to say, effective communication is a skill that can be learned, that in my opinion should be learned. If everybody learned effective communication in school the way we learn all sorts of things that we never end up using, we wouldn't have conferences like this because the world would be a very different place. To be an effective communicator requires you to be a relatively healthy, connected person emotionally, psychologically, and this is a skill that can be learned, and when you do learn it, I can assure you, if you really learn it, this transforms lives, this can transform your life, it can transform all of your communications, not just the ones about veganism. Um, there's a book that I highly recommend, it's called Messages, the Communication Skills Book. You can either write this down, it's on our website that I'll give you at the end of this presentation. Um, it's fabulous, there's a workbook that goes with it, um, and it is really, really worth it. It's worth it, just trust me. Um, effective communication is about focusing on process over content, right? So as content vegans, you know, we're often like, here, if you just want to give you the facts, I want to tell you about animal agriculture, I'm going to tell you about... But the process of the communication is the how, the content is the what, okay? And studies have shown that when people have a communication, they tend to rem remember, well, what do you think? They remember process or content a lot more process right people leave conversations and you i mean you know you can remember a conversation that you've had a day or a week or a month ago and often we remember the feeling we had in the conversation but we don't actually remember the facts we might remember a couple of them a healthy process is a healthy process it doesn't matter what you're talking about whether it's to stay in or go out on a saturday night or whether it's to eat animals or not eat animals the process looks the same a healthy process has as its goal understanding and being understood. That's the whole purpose of communication. The only way you could know what's happening in my mind and in my heart is if I tell you. You can make up all sorts of stories about what's happening, but for you to really know, I need to tell you, and you need to listen, and I need to do the same. If that's your goal when you're talking to people, they will pick it up, and they will be a lot more open to what you have to say. An unhealthy process has a lot of different goals, but one of them is being right. If your goal is to be right and to change the other person, chances are they're gonna pick up on it, even on an unconscious level, and they will be more resistant to your message. I recommend not judging or taking the moral high ground. This is one of the most judgmental individuals I've ever seen. <laughs> and it's an infant, and that really freaks me out. But they got it. It's really funny, it was an interesting picture to find. But anyway, um, it's, it's interesting for vegans, right? So when you're an advocate, advocate rather than a direct victim, you have a lot less like flexibility in terms of like how much kind of moralizing, I guess you can do, expressing of outrage, right? So for example, if somebody is a veteran, like a war veteran speaking out against the war, they can share their outrage and their emotionality in a way, because they're a direct victim, but when you have somebody who's an anti-war activist, they're perceived as moralistic when they're speaking out, because they've made a choice, right, that maybe the listener hasn't made, so the listener may feel more defensive, defended against that message. On a purely strategic level, communicating in a way that expresses any sense of moral, moral superiority is going to shut people down. And People will pick it up if you actually feel morally superior. And I've had a gazillion vegans tell me, but like, but I am morally superior. And like, I'm, I'm here to tell you that we're not. Like, we're not morally superior. And I don't want to get into that, in my opinion, we're not. We don't need to get into a deconstruction of that, but it doesn't serve us to use that framing. We can say that we have chosen to make different choices in our lives, and we believe in our choices. But if we can shift our attitudes so that we don't feel morally superior, that could go a long way. Now, some vegans who don't feel morally superior are perceived this anyway, this way anyway. That's kind of part of a projection. And so it's our job to make sure that we don't take in that projection and act it out. 
Judging people is shaming. When we judge people, we shame them. Whether it's judging them for not being intelligent enough, or rational enough, or moral enough, it doesn't matter what the enough is. Judged people feel shamed, and shamed people are very unlikely to become proactive agents of change. Shamed people withdraw or attack. I always say one of the best ways to get somebody to do the opposite of what you want is to, to shame them. Um, I highly recommend sharing your own story. Virtually all of my advocacy is sharing my own story, right? So if somebody says, well, why did you become vegan? You know, you could be like, well, because, you know, 77 billion animals per year are slaughtered for their flesh and other body parts, and the number one cause of environmental destruction is animal agriculture. Like, you can tell them all the facts, right? Or you can say, why did I become vegan? Why do I believe in veganism? You know what? Because I, I grew up eating meat, but I, I had a dog who I cared about. Whatever your story is, share your story. Nobody can make your story wrong because it's your story. And all of my advocacy, whether it's talking to an audience of 800 meat eaters, or it's on you know, a radio show, or sitting next to people in airplanes, it happens a lot, at least in the US, because the Americans always want to chat with you, um, is you know, I, I, I share my story, and I also share my experience of my own carnistic defenses, right? I'll say, like, you know, I, I just, when I was eating meat, I just didn't make the connection. Like, I didn't think that it was, an, you know, an animal on my plate. Or I used to believe in, like, the, what I learned are the three ends of justification, you know? And when I'm telling people my story, and I'm sharing my experience of the defenses, almost inevitably, they're all like, yeah, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> very receptive. I can't, I can't tell you how many times people are like, me too. And then, you know, you follow up, you too. Really, how does that, what does that look like for you? You know, how does that happen for you? So we started like 10 minutes late, so I have an extra 10 minutes, but okay. Because yeah. I want to just make sure it's like time goes. Um, and of course, we need to find common ground, right? There's this sort of othering process that happens when we become vegan. It's like, oh my god, like, how could you... How would you eat that hamburger? Like, what's wrong with you? Six months ago, maybe that was us. Like, how many of you used to eat animals? I'm just curious. Okay, so there it is. So remember your own carnism. We are bilingual, and the people that we're talking to are, are not bilingual when we're advocating veganism. It's not fair that we have to work to bridge that gap, but it's just the reality. So remember your own carnism. Whenever I'm talking to people, you know, advocating or communicating about veganism, people will be like, oh my god, they hear the title of my book, so you're vegan. You know, so, oh, so you only eat chicken? And, um, and my answer is always the same. Like, I'm vegan today, but for much of my life I wasn't. And it's this, like, palpable, like, <sighs> you know, you can feel it. They're like, oh my god, thank god. You know, it's so easy to forget that we dropped off of trees as, like, you know, vegans. And, and we didn't. Build on existing compassion. Right? There's a wonderful Buddhist statement that says, um, uh, quote, that says, you know, we all have within us the seeds of greed, hatred, and desire, and we also have the seeds within us of, of love, uh, compassion, and empathy. And our job is just to water the right seeds. So when somebody tells you they used to be vegan but they're not anymore, what's your typical question? Yeah, why not? Why'd you stop being vegan? Try saying, why did you become vegan in the first place? And I have had many very interesting conversations around that, and it helps people to reconnect with their natural compassion. And most people, many people did do it for, for ethical reasons, and even, even if not. We want to avoid over-informing. I think, Adriano, somebody talked about this. You know, the statistics often, like, the, the bigger the numbers, the harder it is for people to connect with the fact that these are real issues, real animals. Um, the issue becomes abstraction and abstraction. You know, plant seeds, as Colleen Patrick Goudreau says, give information. There is so much information out there. If people want it, guide them to the information. But just get them, in, in the beginning, you can just get them inspired. Open up, share the truth of your own experience. I highly recommend avoiding what I call reductive thinking. Reductive thinking is what happens when we reduce a person or a, another animal, when we reduce an individual to nothing other than a behavior or a set of behaviors, you know, and we have this way of, it's a form of othering, you know, there's like meat vegans and there's meat eaters and somehow we're fundamentally different. 
Reductive thinking often happens when we um, are eating with somebody who's eating animals. You know, they go in our mind from this to this. <laughs> And this can be just a little problematic. But if we, when we recognize karmas, and we can recognize that good people participate in harmful practices and that doesn't make them bad people. Don't internalize carnism, right? So carnism teaches us how to define ourselves and stereotype ourselves. I'm a picky eater because I won't just pick the ham off the chef's salad and eat it. Well, you know, the meat eater won't pick off the, like, you know, Persian kitten from the chef's salad and eat that. So, not to internalize carnism. We're not too sensitive. You know, when it comes to animal agriculture and the atrocity of carnism, our emotions of, of anger and sadness and despair are normal, healthful, and legitimate, appropriate responses. When it comes to this issue, the world needs more emotion, not less. Not to internalize this idea that we're hypocrites if we wear leather, because then we're extremists if we don't. So recognize secondary defenses and don't internalize them. They're exhausting. Give yourself a permission not to be perfect. The dominant culture projects onto us that we need to be perfect. That is a myth. It's a myth that is repressive to the movement, and it's just not healthy. Just embrace yourself as the messy, complicated human being that you are, that we all are, and life gets a whole lot easier. And so do relationships. It's okay to say, I don't know. Carnistic culture often expects us to be experts on everything. You know, like, oh, you start talking about veganism, and then you have to know about agricultural economics, and organic, organic, hydroponic mushroom farming, and like, like we don't, we're, like, we're not allowed to talk about veganism unless we have all the answers to this, you know, problem that's carnism. We don't, we're not supposed to, it's okay. Recognize and prevent secondary traumatic stress, or STSD. This is like post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, except it impacts the witnesses to um, violence, not the direct victims of violence. Our movement, the animal rights movement, the vegan movement, is like a bunch of walking trauma survivors right now. We're traumatized. It, it takes a tremendous psychological toll to move through this world surrounded by what, by what we're surrounded by. Our efforts to clean up the mess that's made by others are invisible, at best ridiculed often. It takes a psychological toll. Um, and it can cause more problems than it needs to. When we recognize secondary traumatic stress, we can change our relationship with it. And I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. One important way is to not overwitness. Don't watch Earthlings again. Stop watching the graphic imagery. You don't need to. You've seen it. It's not helping the cause. It's just contributing to more trauma. Close your eyes, plug your ears, it's a healthy thing to do to have boundaries. There's a fabulous book called uh, Trauma Stewardship, and the whole book is about recognizing and preventing secondary traumatic stress. I highly, highly recommend it. I suggest being solutionary when we communicate. It's really easy to want to go on and on and on about our problems and what's wrong in the world, but fights of problems, always with an uh, attempt at talking about why being vegan or moving towards veganism is empowering, is empowering, and specific solutions people can adopt. When we make comparisons between human and animal suffering, I suggest we do these very carefully. We can do it. My recommendation is rather than saying, but it's no different, animals feel and humans feel. Most people actually get that animals feel and deserve certain rights. What I recommend that we do is to acknowledge that the victims of violence will always have a unique experience because everybody's experience is unique. However, the ideologies that enable violence are very similar because it's the mentality that enables that violence that is the same. Focus on the mentality that enables violence rather than the victims of the violence. Commit to your own sustainability. Sustainability I define as taking into your life, psychologically, emotionally, physically, socially, 
as much or more that you put out into the world. I give a whole talk on this, um, which I'll, I'll tell you how to access if you're interested. Most importantly is to practice compassion towards self. You are an animal too, we are all animals. I believe that if the vegan movement, I, if social, if activists in general did this one thing and learned effective communication, um, it would transform the movement in some deeply profound ways that might actually do more for the movement than almost anything else we could do. If we have high rates of recidivism and high rates of burnout and high rates of ineffective advocacy, and this is largely due to the fact that we are not committing to our own sustainability and taking care of ourselves and giving ourselves permission to live lives that are actually joyful, to live lives that are healthy and fulfilling. Not just once a week, but every day. Build it in every day. Practice compassion towards self, then you model what you want to see in the world. And modeling is really powerful, even if it sounds cliche. And finally, no, there's reason to hope. There is reason to hope. I think that when we recognize um, carnism, when we recognize this issue from a psychological perspective, it's easier to recognize why we should and could be hopeful in some ways. Um, when a behavior becomes a choice, it takes on an ethical dimension that it did not have in quite the same way before. It's, um, it takes on, it, it brings an ethical issue to the forefront of communication. And virtually all oppressive systems have depended on promoting the idea that the violent behavior is necessary. It's necessary for the survival of the race. It's necessary for the survival of the species. They need to do that to get compassionate people on board with uncompassionate practices. We can see this obviously with eating animals. Today, more and more people are recognizing that it's not necessary, more and more people are engaging in this conversation, and more and more people are choosing to say no to carnism and to become a part of the solution. One could argue that I live in a vegan bubble, and I'm saying that there is a lot of evidence demonstrating that the vegan movement and to support for veganism is growing all over the world. I've given my carnism presentation on, on five continents now in close to 30 countries, and spoken with media all around, meat-eating media all around the world, and I have seen this tremendous support and excitement and desire to be involved in the transformation of this oppression. And I think there's reason to be very, very hopeful. Carnism, psychologically similar to other isms like sexism and racism and classism, we can see the trajectory of those isms going down. There's absolutely no reason to believe that the trajectory of carnism will not follow them. It already is. So I want to um, just wrap up by thank, thank you for being a part of this solution and being a part of this incredibly important movement that I think will be looked back upon one day as one of the most transformational social justice movements in human history. Thank you.